We will begin and we are recording. All right. So again, welcome everyone and thank you all for joining a little bit earlier to those who did. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's Intech and welcome to today's webinar, Interviewing Children with Disabilities. This webinar is brought to you in part by our colleagues at the Zero Abuse Project uh, in conjunction with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items just to keep in mind. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. This webinar, along with other webinars, are available on OJJDP's multimedia page or YouTube channel. We encourage you to please go visit that channel for more webinars around juvenile justice and child victimization prevention. For the transcript and supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA help desk and we'll be more than happy to get those items to you. If you're having trouble downloading the items today, please note that my colleague has put in a um, Google Drive link in the chat to everyone. Simply click on that Google Drive link and you should be able to get access to the materials related to today's web event. If you're having trouble accessing those items, please feel free to contact the OJJDP TTA help desk. We'll be more than happy to get those items to you. You can reach us at that email address that's on your screen there. For optimal audio, we encourage you to please utilize the dial out option through WebEx to your phone. When you're connected, you'll see either a phone icon or a headset icon located next to your name in the participants link there to show that you do have audio. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a private chat to me, William Moore, or my co-host, Alicia Lord. It will be more than happy to assist you with that. Please note that all members have come in on mute. And even if you are showing your camera, please note that only the presenters can be seen at this moment. Thank you. We will be taking your questions during today's web event. To ask a question, simply go to the chat window, type in your question. However, prior to hitting send, please select all panelists to make sure that we will be able to see your question. So again, go to the chat window, type in your question, but before you hit send, please select all panelists. And we can practice that right now. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, please note that if you're viewing with additional people, we would like for you to type in the total number of additional people that are in the room with you today. So again, if you're viewing, say, with your program manager or someone else in the room with you, please go to the chat window, select all panelists, and type in the total number of additional people that are in the room with you today so that we can have an accurate count for today's webinar. Please note that attendees will receive a certificate of attendance within 24 hours via a thank you email from WebEx. Please be on the lookout for that certificate. Here's our agenda for today. And uh, just a reminder to folks, please make sure that you complete the polling question. If you haven't done so, you have about two minutes to do that and provide us some feedback. I am going to go ahead and turn over today's presenter to Katie, or our presentation, excuse me, to Katie. And Katie, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Dahl. I'm a forensic interview specialist with Zero Abuse Project. So part of my role here at Zero Abuse Project is uh, delivering content like I'm delivering today. Uh, I've delivered some other webinars with OJJDP. I deliver uh, trainings and webinars to other platforms. I'm national faculty for the Child First Forensic Interview Protocol. Uh, and another big part of my job that I love to do is technical assistance. So uh, I'm gonna flip to my next slide here. So while I talk, you can jump down my email if you would like to uh, utilize me for technical assistance in the future. That is a service provided to you by Zero Abuse Project. So anytime, if you have a question regarding any of the content I talked about today, 
or in general, forensic interviewing, um, child maltreatment investigations, uh, testifying to your forensic interview or as an expert witness, uh, I would love to chat through any of that with you. So uh, this is my contact information and you can go ahead and reach out. Uh, Prior to my role here uh, full time with Zero Abuse Project, I did a lot of contract work with them uh, as a trainer for Child First. I work at a child advocacy center up in Duluth, Minnesota, where I am located. Um, so in my role there, I was a forensic program coordinator where I conducted forensic interviews and supervised um, our forensic program. I also facilitated a multidisciplinary team and assisted in the implementation of another more rural um, multidisciplinary team. So a little bit about my background. I'm really excited to be here with you all today and we're going to go through some considerations and techniques for interviewing children or really just individuals with disabilities. Okay, it looks like there are some viewing problems with the presentation. Uh, folks aren't seeing um, PowerPoint, PowerPoint slides in the link or a presentation on the screen. If someone can see the PowerPoint on the screen, can you please let me know in the chat so I can see that. Okay, sounds like folks can see the presentation. Awesome. Uh, if you need that link again, please uh, also put that in the chat so Alicia or William can make sure you do get that link. It looks like maybe some folks have some problems with it. All right, perfect. Thank you all so much for letting me know you can see. Okay, so again, here is my slide. Uh, first, uh, thank you to OJJDP. Uh, we're able to deliver this content and so much of the incredible content we can get to folks across the nation uh, due to the Trauma Informed Prosecutor Project and support from OJJDP. So thank you so much. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, like I said, is interviewing individuals with disabilities. And there's so much important front work that goes into this to really be able to individualize the process to the child or the person that we'll be working with so we can set them up for the best experience and we can have the best opportunity to really uh, have a quality in interview with the child or the person in front of us. It's really important to really get engaged with your community. There are so many uh, folks out there that are experts. We don't need to be the experts in everything. Utilize those experts in your community. Uh, create relationships, bring them onto your multidisciplinary team if that's an option for you. Um, we can, uh, there's different ways we can involve people on the multidisciplinary team. You may have those core central investigative team members. You may also bring in folks that have other expertise or perspective uh, in order to really meet the needs of those kids you're seeing without having to be an expert in everything because that's, uh, we want to funnel that effort into serving kids as a forensic interviewer, law enforcement, social worker, uh, whatever your role or discipline is, uh, so we can bring those folks in uh, to assist. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Partners for Inclusive Communities for also their information that assisted in the um, development of this presentation. So some things we must have in this work is an MDT approach. Uh, with any a uh, forensic interview, we should be utilizing an MDT approach. We are bringing the disciplines and our expertise around the child rather than making the family uh, reach out to um, all of these different services. Yes, uh, I just got a quick uh, question here. I'm gonna take just a quick pause to pass over the PowerPoint uh, or the controls. So William can help me out with something real quick, and then uh, I'll keep talking about this slide as he does that. Uh, so again, we need to use a coordinated multidisciplinary team response to be able to serve victims, not only all the victims we see, uh, but the victims with disabilities. Uh, again, bringing in those multiple expertise, getting information on how we can best serve these populations. Uh, it, some other things that are really important for folks to have is training on the different populations of kids you may be serving. So uh, you're here today and I'm really excited that you're able to join here in this presentation because uh, that's training. This is really going to assist you again in uh, meeting the needs of those kids. So again, thank you so much for uh, choosing this topic to join today. 
All right. Uh, technical assistance, like I mentioned, I love providing technical assistance. It's like my favorite part of my job is getting to interact one on one with folks uh, and assist any way that I can be of assistance to you. Uh, so reach out to technical assistance for zero abuse project or again from community organizations uh, as an example that i'll probably be talking about more uh, throughout our time together today uh, some communities may have um, disability serving organizations that may have a lending library maybe they have different kinds of devices in order to assist uh, children in communicating or uh, assist with their mobility, assist with their comfort or their ability to um, be, feel relaxed and comfortable in a new environment. Uh, so connect with those local organizations and see what tools you may have available to you or you may be able to utilize uh, when you have a child or, or a victim that could really benefit from this. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit here right away about some vulnerabilities that are specific to children with disabilities. Of course, all children are vulnerable. Uh, adults need to protect them. And unfortunately, we live in a world where that's not always the case with adults. That's why we're all employed, uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, there are certain things that make kids with disabilities more vulnerable to victimization or abuse, and that leave it harder for them to make a disclosure or access our services. So the bottom line, the thing we need to remember about every single child we serve in this role is that they're all children first. Kids with disabilities, same, are kids first. Um, so the skills and instincts you would use in a typical interview continue to hold true in our interviews with these kids, but there are some adjustments or flexibilities we can utilize to be able to adapt and adjust uh, to best serve that kid in front of us. But remember to always go back to those basics, uh, your, your skills, your question types, and again, we're going to talk through a lot of those techniques here as we go uh, this afternoon. Uh, a really important place to start is to just understand the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and what those requirements are and how they may be applicable to your space or your center. Uh, what, they're, uh, what this breaks down to is it's per civil rights protections for any individuals with disabilities, uh, and it requires public uh, to make accommodations uh, or reasonable accommodations or modifications in their policies, practices, and procedures to best accommodate individuals with disabilities. So your space, bottom line, physically should be accessible to anybody that may be coming through those doors. Is it wheelchair accessible? Is it walker accessible? Or any other kind of mobility aid someone may be utilizing, uh, canes or scooters or uh, whatever else that may be. Do you, not only is the building accessible, but is the interview room accessible? Is the play space or the family room, the restroom, Anywhere that kids may be utilizing in your space, is it accessible for all of those kids who may um, communicate differently, who may get around differently? We need to make sure that you're making uh, reasonable modifications to make our space accessible and your services accessible. Uh, so forensic interviewers should be aware of ADA requirements and you can certainly find more at ada.gov. Another law to be uh, familiar with is Rose's Law. This law was signed into law in 2010 by President Obama. Uh, and what this law says, it amends the language in all federal health, education, and labor laws to remove the term mental retardation and instead change it to intellectual disability or Americans living with an intellectual disability. So uh, as we go throughout the presentation today, I will be going over some older research studies prior to 2010. Uh, so they may have used the term mental retardation. It's been abbreviated to MR in some slides, but uh, verbally I'll be talking about intellectual disability. So uh, again, we wanna make sure all language and all of our policies, procedures, paperwork uh, is updated to reflect that change as well. So speaking of that change, I want to touch on language. Uh, we want to use respectful language with everybody that we're working with uh, in these roles. So some language to avoid are things like low or high functioning. Uh, you may use language like this still or have previously heard language like this used when referring to people with disabilities. Are they, you know, uh, 
maybe previously you've heard it uh, when referring to kids with autism, uh, that they are, you know, on a spectrum, are they low functioning or high functioning? That is too, I don't know, like there's not enough nuance in there to break down where like we can't just peg kids with autism into uh, into this pot or this pot, right? They have so much uh, nuances and things that they uh, may really, really excel at and other things that they may not, that just labeling a person generally and as a whole as lower high functioning is not respectful and it's not appropriate. Uh, so when we think of those people and how we refer to them, uh, we wanna make sure that they're feeling good, they're feeling supported, they're feeling respected in their space. So we also want to think of some of the other populations we serve and how maybe not necessarily how we refer to them, maybe how you've referred to them, if you might need to examine some of that language you've used or how people in our society refer to folks with disabilities and the language that they use. Um, so we want to switch to using uh, respectful language. So some things, again, may be uh, intellectual disabilities, cognitive disabilities, or learning disabilities, again, as opposed to um, some of the formerly used words like we saw on the last slide. Uh, some people really prefer person-first language. And what I mean by person-first is putting the person before another part of their identity. So you may have heard instead of, uh, an autistic child, uh, a child with autism, or that person has autism, they're not autistic. And some people prefer that person first language, but also some people uh, prefer that label coming first because it is such a huge part of their identity and how they do see themselves. So um, person first language can be respectful and appropriate, but some people also do prefer uh, the other way. So some people do prefer the label autistic rather than a person with autism. So do make sure that you're in tune and you are adapting your language based on the person's preferences. And it is appropriate to ask too if you're not sure. So uh, something to keep in mind as well, that different people have different relationships to how that language is used to describe them. Uh, so again, instead of calling someone a wheelchair user or wheelchair bound, we may say that person uses a wheelchair uh, because that, that, that may not be a part of their identity that they hold um, inside. So we wanna make sure that we're using appropriate and respectful language. And sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we make mistakes with our language, say something we didn't mean, say something because we're working on adjusting or changing that language and we're practicing. And sometimes we make mistakes and that's a Okay, we just want to acknowledge it, uh, apologize, and then move on. Uh, folks, if you make a mistake when referring to somebody in a way that they um, don't feel comfortable being referred to uh, or referred to as, we don't want to make a big deal about it. You know, we don't want to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, I should never have done that. And like, you're making a big scene, bringing all these other people in, and you're just drawing a lot of attention to this person who. Uh, you may have offended with your language in the first place, and uh, that may just be uncomfortable or a little chaotic, and it's then putting um, kind of like, you should be apologizing to the person that you've wronged or harmed with your language, and instead you're kind of putting yourself at the center uh, of that interaction. So again, if you do make mistakes, uh, acknowledge it, apologize, and move on, but start to think about just the language that you're utilizing when working with people with differing abilities. Yes, all right, I see some stuff in the chat. I love what you're saying. Yes, low and high functioning is way too vague when talking about a population as diverse as this, absolutely. I've interviewed you know, so many children with autism in my career and not one of them interacted or presented the same way as another. And it's just too much to put them into one box or another. It's not really helping me prepare as an interviewer because I don't know what that means. That can mean so many different things. Uh, I also had someone in here say, I also cringe when people use age equivalents, like functions like a five-year-old. Yes, yeah, I love that you brought that up. I was gonna bring this uh, example up later, but I think this is a great place to bring it up right now. Uh, just about a year and a half ago, maybe a little longer, you know, these last two years time has kind of melded together. Uh, I interviewed a child who, um, preparing for the interview when it was scheduled, they said the child was 14 and nonverbal. So nonverbal is definitely something to prepare for, for the interview. So I did a lot of preparation, reached out to some of my colleagues in the field to get some insights on things they've done that have worked for them. I've done interviews before with kids who were 
um, not very verbal or had less verbal abilities, uh, but I had never at that point interviewed somebody completely nonverbal. Um, so yeah, when uh, law enforcement health called the schedule, they said she had, a, uh, she had disabilities and was nonverbal and presented as like an eight-year-old. So like you're saying, it was equivalent to like an eight-year-old functioning, used that language. Um, so I did a lot of preparation for this child coming in. Uh, she gets in the room. I start to ask her, you know, I start to prepare her, orient her, start to ask her some questions. And she just went on talking about uh, a time that her and her friend pulled a prank on the principal at school. And this kid was so verbal, like I couldn't even find a place to get in to like ask a next question or, or redirect. Uh, she just could talk and talk and talk. So it turns out that like somewhere on her paperwork, it was listed that she had a nonverbal learning disability, but that was something she had had uh, in her paperwork or diagnosed when she was very young, like three or four years old. Uh, so it just didn't really describe uh, this child or their abilities coming in. So my, all my preparation was for not uh, in this case. It has come in handy down the line though in other cases. Additionally, they're like, oh yeah, she's not verbal and uh, is equivalent to like an eight year old. But what does that mean? This is a kid that was completely verbal, talking about her experiences at high school, able to understand and answer my questions. Uh, she was a little bit, you know, uh, maybe not as mature as a typical 14 year old, but again, that's another population of kids, preteens or early adolescents who are wildly different and using one or two boxes to put them into is either mature or not as mature again is just too vague for a nuanced topic. So uh, she may have presented a bit younger in some ways, but also presented older in some ways. So to just peg kids as like presents like an eight year old, uh, I don't think is very helpful in us preparing to really do these interviews because what does that mean? I've also interviewed hundreds of eight year olds maybe I don't have an actual count but many 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 eight-year-olds and again they don't all present the same so there's not just like one box that eight-year-olds fit into so uh, I love the comments that you're putting in here um, and just the ways we're talking about how kids present because even kids without disabilities like every single kid presents differently uh, so we want to ask more questions when if we're getting a call to schedule stuff like that and uh, folks are using really vague terms because maybe that's what they were told or it's in the paperwork. Uh, I don't think anyone's maliciously uh, using this language, uh, perhaps, but uh, just ask some more questions or maybe if you do a pre-call, and we're going to talk about some pre-interview prep uh, later on too, but uh, just ask some senator questions to really understand what that means or how this kid communicates, all of the ways the kid communicates uh, to be able to make the best experience for them. All right. All right, I'm just reading some more comments here. Awesome. Yes, some folks are saying high and low functioning is also very subjective because maybe somebody who doesn't have a ton of interactions with this kid has had a couple interactions and the kid is really reluctant or shy or tentative. So they may be less verbal or less engaged with this person. So they may make a determination on their functioning level based on that. But it could just be that child's discomfort around that person or really any other factor. Yes. All right. Cool. Yes, I see some folks that can't see all the chats. Uh, if they're going to all panelists, they're coming to me, but don't worry, I'll let you know what I see in the chat. So we're going to go through some statistics here talking about kids with disabilities and why uh, they may be at higher risk and what that risk looks looks like in terms uh, of numbers. So uh, here's some statistics here. We see that about 21 out of 1,000 children without disabilities experience abuse, whereas 35 and a half kids with disabilities uh, experience abuse. So that's three, almost three and a half times more likely for kids with disabilities to be neglected or physically, uh, emotionally or sexually abused than kids without disabilities. What the statistics and research see is that um, the kids with disabilities that experience maltreatment are also more likely to be male. And I'm gonna talk through over the next few slides some reasons why um, kids with disabilities are at higher risk or they do experience victimization at higher rates. Um, so we'll go through that soon, but on top of all of the reasons I'm about to talk about, there is also a dynamic in our culture that uh, we don't leave a ton of space or our culture and society doesn't leave a ton of space for men to see themselves as victims. 
uh, when we think of how male victims are treated in media, on Facebook, uh, in society, the other ways we engage with people, uh, it can be hard for them to feel like they have someone to disclose to, uh, that someone will take them seriously or believe them. You know, I think of like this rhetoric that still exists today, um, like the hot teacher rhetoric, right, is in play when it's a male student and a female teacher. Uh, I've had a similar case in my community where uh, a female teacher perpetrated on a student. And in the comment section, which I know I should never read, uh, but still did, there's people out there talking about, you know, like, oh, where was that teacher when I was in high school? Or like, that kid sounds pretty lucky to me, right? Just like really egregious things to say about a child who has been victimized by an adult when those dynamics aren't the same if it was a male teacher uh, and a female child, where as a society much quicker to recognize that as abuse or something wrong. Uh, so again, men and male and boys are exposed to that kind of rhetoric in the media and those notions. And those are just some of them, but there's so many myths around male victimization uh, that can make it really hard for them to come out with their abuse. So compounded on top of a lot of the reasons, I'll talk about why kids with disabilities won't or can't disclose, uh, that added dynamic may compound. So we do see, um, uh, those males with disabilities more represented in our statistics here. Um, so some increased risk for abuse uh, may be kids who have intellectual or specific learning disabilities. We see in the research and the data that they're at increased risk for forced prostitution. Uh, so when we see kids uh, with different kind of cognitive or intellectual disabilities, they may have more isolation from, you know, community. They may not have uh, as big of groups groups of like friends or people that they interact with, they may not be, you know, involved in like the typical sports teams or other like communities in school. Uh, and they may be, a lot of kids are looking for that connection, um, those relationships, people to care about them outside of the people that are there, like their caretakers who are taking care of them, even when they love to do that. Uh, but so they may be vulnerable to flattery of folks who are drawing them into exploitation. Uh, they've even sometimes experienced exploitation within their own family unit. Uh, kids with visual impairments are at increased risk for abuse at about two times that of kids without. And children with learning or orthopedic disabilities, which I know are both pretty different, uh, we're at risk for maltreatment again at about two times that of kids without disabilities. Again, we'll get into some more reasons here shortly. Uh, somebody had a comment that I absolutely agree with. It doesn't help that media boosts the stereotype of the hot teacher in comedies and movies. Yes, absolutely. I haven't seen as many in recent years, but there are so many songs out there, movies, TV shows, tropes, even I think Jay Leno's talked about it on his show, uh, that trope of the hot teacher uh, that continues right to perpetuate that. So that's what male victims or men are exposed to uh, that can show them like, oh, people aren't going to take me seriously. They're going to think I wanted this. Uh, or that I'm lucky, or, or um, I can't be abused because I'm a man, or a male, or a boy, right? So, yes, I absolutely agree that it does not help that media continues to perpetuate that stereotype. It's actually very harmful. All right, back to these statistics. I got a little off, off base there with, uh, or off track with that comment, but I love to read your comments, so thank you for sharing. Uh, so other increased risks or vulnerabilities for abuse are kids with um, just health impairments are at an increased risk at about three times. Uh, and when we think of kids with any kind of health impairments, whether they're physical or intellectual or cognitive, is they may have more caretakers in their lives, more adults that have one-on-one -on -one or private access to them, especially sometimes when that access may be helping to shower or toilet or change something where they would have reasons to have contact with the child's body. Uh, we do see that that puts kids at higher risk because though they may only have access to those caretakers as adults uh, and those caretakers may be the ones perpetuating the abuse. So they may have a lack of people to make a disclosure to because they may be experiencing abuse by their caretakers or those people they are exposed to. Uh, and additionally, I've, not, I've interviewed a number of folks, uh, you know, both adults, vulnerable adults in care facilities, as well as children in residential facilities or homes where they have caretaking. 
uh, that have disclosed abuse and what the explanation is by the offender when they're interviewed it, of why there may be DNA in a, a certain part of a child's body is, well, I, I help them to toilet or I help them change, I help them shower. So there would be a reason for them to have some kind of contact with their body. So sometimes that can, if a kid doesn't have the ability to really communicate to us exactly what happened, uh, that alternative hypothesis, unfortunately, sometimes may, may take kind of center stage in these investigations. So again, we see higher rates of victimization for these uh, kids. Uh, children with hearing disabilities have been found to be abused at four times out of kids without hearing disabilities. Uh, and kids with intellectual disabilities, again, are also been increased by, at about four times uh, of that of kids without. Uh, children that have speech or language disabilities are at about five times higher risk than kids without uh, to be physically or physically abused or neglected and about three times more likely to be sexually abused than kids without those speech and language disabilities. Again, when we're thinking about victimization, offenders typically target their, um, their victim for specific reasons. So if they are looking for somebody to target somebody that has vulnerabilities that will help them gain and maintain access to their victim, uh, somebody with speech and language disabilities may be a vulnerable target for them because they may not have the physical ability to communicate to somebody else they have experienced abuse, or they may not have the words or the language or know how to communicate to somebody that something wrong has happened to their body. Uh, so we may see higher rates of victimization uh, for a lot of reasons, but then also high uh, lower rates of disclosure uh, for those reasons as well. We also see kids with behavioral disorders, things like anxiety, uh, conduct disorder, uh, autism or schizophrenia, things that may affect their behavior. We see these kids maybe seven times more likely to be neglected physically or emotionally abused and five and a half times more likely to be sexually abused. So we see a really, really high uh, instance with kiddos here. Um, I know when we think about, you know, stress in the home, sometimes stress can also be risk factors when there's a lot of stress on the parents or the caregivers, it can be risk factors of abuse for the children. And I know sometimes, you know, parents who aren't supported or ha don't have proper support for education uh, may experience that those levels of stress higher. And uh, unfortunately, that sometimes may be taken out on these children uh, who we see are at higher risk uh, for those types of abuse. Uh, also, too, this is a really generalized category. Uh, about a year and a half ago, some of my colleagues at the CAC I previously worked full time at uh, still do conduct interviews at. We really pulled the data for the last handful of years on the disabilities because we just, uh, in our spreadsheet where we track information, track uh, the disabilities of children as well. And we found that over almost over half of the kids that we see uh, pretty consistently have some kind of disability. Uh, and I know that that uh, sounds like a lot, but a lot of those are things like anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, some of those. And, uh, you know, they may not be always thought of as those higher level disabilities that may impact a child's uh, functioning or ability to communicate, but they do impact a child's ability or willingness to communicate. And we see that represented in so many of the kids we see. So just, it's really staggering to look at these statistics and see how much higher of a risk these kids are at for experiencing maltreatment uh, than their counterparts without the disabilities. So some factors that increase risk of abuse for these kids, why we see these uh, numbers so much higher is in general, our society has rather devaluing attitudes towards children, uh, especially children with disabilities. You know, in general, as a society, we don't take kids seriously. We think they're sneaky and lying and conniving. Uh, oftentimes when they make a claim of sexual abuse as a society, uh, we wanna think of every other possible explanation first because we don't wanna believe that it's happening at the rate that it is, that child abuse is happening. Uh, so in general, our, our society has a rather devaluing attitude towards children, uh, but especially kids with disabilities and in general people with disabilities. So um, that can impact uh, their ability to access care or for people to really understand and take them seriously. Uh, there may be poor communication between parents and children. Parents may not have the supports or education or really understand how to effectively communicate with their child. Uh, like I talked about, stress is a risk factor for abuse. I talked about that on the, the last slide or two, but I even 
think about putting that in a really global context or national context from the last few years, um, early 2020 in uh, just after March 2020, when the pandemic first started sweeping across the, the, the world, really, and schools started to shut down all across the nation, uh, kids were sent home for essentially their parents to educate them for a couple months, because at that point, it was like those first few months of that pandemic, teachers weren't prepared with an online curriculum, so they did their best, they did really well, um, but at that point, parents were under a lot of stress. We had parents who were maybe either losing their job or had significantly cut hours or um, were sent home to work, so we're working from home. Uh, at the same time, we have children who are now coming home and being schooled from home. Uh, in some places, it was very effective. Some places, it was very, very challenging for children. So a lot of parents were essentially becoming homeschool teachers uh, on top of maybe working their own job or having just been laid off and trying to figure out how to make ends meet. They're now their kids now home 24 seven. Uh, there may be financial stress. There was so many stressors going on and we did see at that point, we didn't necessarily see a spike in the kids we were seeing because of the pandemic and the stay-at-home orders. Uh, but when kids were then re-exposed to mandated reporters, uh, I know many places saw a spike in the reports from children from that period of, of being at home in those really stressful situations. We saw that stress really increased the risk of abuse for children uh, in those homes. So similarly, uh, these households, uh, again, may be under stress for a lot of different reasons that may be related to or not related to the abilities in the home. Uh, and that could be a risk factor for folks in that home. Uh, sometimes as well, a risk factor may be family shame um, that may precipitate abandonment of the child, institutionalization of the child, uh, potentially abuse and neglect in the home or abuse and neglect once they've been institutionalized or abandoned by the family. Uh, we also see some other factors that sometimes children just don't know that what happened to them was wrong, uh, especially, you know, kids who may be a little bit more isolated and don't have as much access to folks outside of those situations. Um, what is taught to them is what's normal to them. If that's what they've been around, if that's what they've been told is normal, or if that's what's happening so chronically, so repeated, it may just be normalized to them. And sometimes abuse isn't physically hurtful to children. Offenders, again, want to maintain access to their victims, so they're not always going to make the abuse hurt. Um, sometimes it's a fun game. Sometimes it feels good to the child's body, so they may not always be aware that what's happening is wrong, uh, so they may not disclose for those reasons. Uh, Oftentimes we see these kids may be socially isolated and due to their inability to participate. So if a child isn't physically able to make a disclosure, um, then they're often not screened in to be even have a forensic interview because they don't have communication skills. So we're missing so many of these kids sometimes, or they may not have even had the opportunity to make a disclosure in the first place. Uh, and then, like I said earlier, increasing the number of caregivers included in a child's care increases their vulnerability. Uh, the more adults they have in their life that are, um, you know, have time alone with them, who have roles where they may already be touching the child's body, uh, could put this child at risk. Additionally, folks in these caretaking positions are usually, you know, and the vast majority of most of them are so well-meaning and really kind hearted, lovely people. So that's how we see caretakers, right? That's how they should be. They're using their time to spend to assist another person to kind of live their best life. Um, so they also have that societal kind of halo around their head that it's hard, hard for folks to believe that this really wonderful caretaker uh, could actually do something to harm the person they're caretaking. Again, as a society, that may be the image. Uh, kids are um, taught to be compliant and obedient to authority figures. You think about the education you probably got as a child, the stranger danger. You know, if a stranger tries to give you candy and pull you into their truck, you kick and you scream and you run away. Uh, but what do we teach kids about the adults they know in their life, their coaches, their teachers, their aunts, uncles, grandparents, moms, dads, their friends, parents, uh, their guidance counselor, their camp counselor, really any single adult that an, a child interacts with that they know or have a reason to know, we teach them to obey them, obey adults, listen to adults, do what you're told, don't talk back. 
So we don't really give kids the skills or the tools to, you know, disclose against or disobey or uh, and tell somebody about the abuse if they've been told not to tell anyone. We teach kids to obey. So that's what we're instilling. We don't really always give them the tools to disobey uh, those adults that are supposed to be trusted with the child. Uh, again, physical disabilities may increase the likelihood of physical caretaking. Again, that contact uh, could put kids at risk because it could serve as the alternative hypothesis or kind of a shield uh, for that person being caught because they will have explanations for having um, touched the child's body. And some other factors that may increase risk may be a in in, uh, physical inability to fight back, defend, or escape. Uh, again, it's not very common in general for children to do that in these cases because of all of the other societal uh, rules and notions and things that are happening during the abuse, the fear. Uh, often kids are frozen in fear. They don't know what to do. Uh, but even if a child wanted to, uh, many kids with disabilities may not physically be able to fight back or defend themselves. Uh, I talked a little bit about language def uh, deficits, decreased reporting for children. Again, if they can't communicate or they don't have the language, how are they supposed to tell someone? Uh, even some kids who may utilize some facilitation devices like a language board or, um, you know, some like tablets have language facilitation. But a lot of times kids are really confined to responses that are preloaded onto those devices. So if they don't have access to language or to be able to say um, what has happened, how are they going to communicate that to somebody? Uh, again, there's a lack of safety education for kids, parents, and caregivers. I talked briefly about probably all of our safety education with the as kids revolved around stranger danger. Uh, luckily, prevention, more comprehensive prevention education is sweeping the country. There are still a few states that need to get on board, but many states uh, have enacted Jenna's law, which does require teaching of prevention education for kids. Uh, and it is more comprehensive than stranger danger, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, but we're getting there. We're making those but uh, that safety education for kids is really important, teaching them about the autonomy over their body and, and what they should tell people about. Um, additionally, we may see kids have a desire for attention and affection. Again, these may be kids who may not be uh, as readily welcomed into some traditional friend groups or clubs or things at school, unfortunately, and uh, they may be looking for that attention, affection, friendship, um, flattery and other avenues. And if they are receiving it from an offender in, you know, the offender knows it probably as grooming and manipulation, uh, but to this child, uh, those things feel really nice and they may be uh, vulnerable to that flattery, uh, attention and affection. Uh, we've also got so, so some systemic problems. That's a lot of S's in a row. Uh, we have some systemic problems. Uh, that may also contribute to um, the vulnerability of these children. Uh, we see sometimes their injuries may be masked by their disability. Uh, again, it may be their disability, uh, if it's mobility related, maybe sometimes they fall or bump into something and sustain bruising that way. Uh, so if they sustain bruising from the abuse, it could be explained away uh, by, you know, oh, well, he's supposed to walk with the walker, but he didn't and he fell. Right, uh, parents may explain away uh, that type of behavior. We do see a lack of resources for parents and caregivers, as well as a lack of training. Uh, so that's something that, again, societally needs to change. But by connecting with MDT or bringing folks into your MDT, making relationships with those folks in your community with expertise on serving kids with disabilities, uh, maybe we can also band together and try to get folks in our community more training and more services and more awareness of what services may be available to them. Uh, also, we see that kids with disabilities are overrepresented among victims. I showed you a lot of those statistics. Again, there are two, three, four, five times as likely to experience abuse based on different kind of abilities or disabilities than kids without. However, they're underrepresented on our caseloads. So we see that they're experiencing abuse at a much higher rate, but they're not coming to our attention at that same rate for a lot of those reasons that I just talked about. They, every single kid has hundreds of barriers to disclosing. Kids with disabilities have just that much more. Uh, because of a lot of those reasons I was talking through, and there could even be some additional more that's not necessarily an exhaustive list. 
uh, again, I, I talked a little bit about as a society, uh, may not represent all of us because we work in this every day and we see this every day, but as a society, we don't want to believe that kids are abused at the rate that they are experiencing abuse, especially in our own communities, right? Well, that doesn't happen here. Uh, so that contributes to not believing children uh, because we don't want to believe these things, these horrible things happen so often. So maybe it's your imagination. You watched a movie. Uh, that's not what they meant. They were just helping you go to the bathroom, right? There may be these ways to be in denial and explain it away. Even if we're very well-meaning, it's, it's something that people are very much in denial of when they first learn about it. Uh, additionally, out-of-home placements may not always be available to meet the needs of the children. Um, so we see that sometimes they're relying on congregate care where they may actually receive less care because there's a lot of other kids that need caretaking as well. Um, this is a little opposite, but I did interview a kid one time, she was 13, and she had been uh, sexually assaulted a few times by her 19-year-old brother. Uh, her 19-year-old brother uh, has some pretty... Um, you know, severe cognitive disabilities. He needed a lot of caretaking. Um, and so when she disclosed the sexual assault, what ended up happening, unfortunately, was she was actually removed from the home and placed in a safe foster um, placement because there was nowhere for her brother to go, who was the offender. Her dad was both of their caretakers. Her mom had passed away a few years ago and her dad was taking care of them. And they try to find places for the brother to go so the child could still stay in her home and feel safe in her home. But there just wasn't a place that was able to take him that was able to both care for um, him and his needs and also make sure other folks in the home were safe due to um, the assaults that he had perpetrated. So there may just not be uh, services for these folks. So uh, it's really hard to get them the care they need sometimes. Um, so again, in that case, again, it was the offender and uh, not the victim, but this victim ended up leaving the home and then feeling as though um, she had been punished for making that disclosure. So uh, we just may see some different dynamics in there too. Uh, these kids may sometimes require specialized care that may not be available in the foster placements that you have access to. Uh, and finally, I brought this up a few times, but again, that difficulty communicating with investigators even if they've been able to make a disclosure or maybe their teacher has noticed um, bruising or some signs of potential neglect or abuse when they made a report. Um, oftentimes, if you're not able to communicate with a child, there's not a lot to go off of. So really being able to do everything you can to adapt to the needs of that child communication is really imperative. Uh, and again, we're gonna go through some uh, strategies here as we, as we continue today. So as we go, I just wanna think of some different stereotypes that as a society we hold about kids or people with uh, disabilities. Uh, we may see that they're helpless, they need caretaking, they, they can't do things on their own, which may be the case sometimes, but a lot of them do have a lot of autonomy, uh, that they're fragile and need protection and they're at risk. So again, just thinking about the way we uh, think about or talk about these kids can really frame how or when or if we believe uh, or receive the information they're trying to share with us when they've experienced abuse. Uh, so here's just like a brief overview of some of the research uh, that has been conducted on interviewing children with disabilities. What they found is that open-ended questions can be still successful with these kids. Uh, you may need to proceed to more specific questions for clarification, um, but I'm always at least trying open-ended questions with these kids. They may be slightly less open-ended than others, but WH questions can still be open-ended. Uh, Tom Lyon has a really excellent article about open-ended WH questions. Uh, if you just Google Tom Lyon open-ended WH questions, it should come up. Uh, his works are typically available for free. Uh, Tom Lyon is a really excellent researcher, but um, he has an article about sometimes we do need to be a little bit more concrete about what we're asking, but can still keep it nice and open. And that can be really helpful with some kids with disabilities. We're still asking them open-ended questions, but there's a bit more structure to it rather than tell me all about that or what's everything that happened, because those are sometimes too big, too broad, too open. Yes. I'm typing in the chat. Somebody asked if I could add that to the chat. So Tom Lyon, um, the title is slightly longer than that, but I know it includes 
open-ended WH questions in the title. Uh, so if you Google that, it should pop up again. Tom Lyon has uh, many of his works available for free. And I know that one is free because I've looked it up a number of times and I've been able to find it uh, just Googling that. So uh, I, it's a really easy to read article too. I'm a total research nerd, so I love reading research articles, but for folks that aren't who don't love reading research, it's still a very easily digestible, readable article. That's what I really appreciate about Tom Lyon's research is it's very easy to digest and read. And use. Um, so with these kids, again, start with those open-ended questions. You may proceed to more specific questions to clarify uh, things like yes or no, uh, but we wanna make sure we're continuing our use of these questions in a non-coercive manner. Uh, so all of our interviews are avoiding coercion and suggestibility, similarly with these interviews. It's also imperative that in all interviews, we're exploring alternative hypotheses, which means we're exploring other possible explanations for the report. So again, I said a lot of times, uh, if kids have physical caretaking, an alternative hypothesis may be that the touching happened during the caretaking. So we really need to make sure we're exploring everything about the abuse incident that we're uh, able to, so we can differentiate between the two and corroborate the child's statements. Uh, what we do know is kids with disabilities may be slightly more suggestible than kids without. Uh, research does show that by the age of 10, children are no more suggestible than an adult. However, uh, folks with disabilities, again, may be more suggestible than others. Uh, and that may be due to some reasons like being eager to please the interview, right? They're eager to please. They Kids in general are eager to please. Think about, you know, when you were in school and if the teacher asked a question and called on you, you wanted to have the right answer. It was really embarrassing to like raise your hand and be like, oh, oh I know it. And you get called on and say the wrong thing. I was always like so embarrassed. I don't know if I was just like a child riddled with anxiety, but I can't be the only one who had that experience. So kids want to please adults, they want to have the answers. Uh, so these children as well may be more eager to please. So we need to make sure we're not being suggestive through our language and behavior. So um, we're not creating that dynamic. Uh, they also may have reduced confidence in their own memory. Again, think about not only the way society sees them, but the way society treats them, talks to them, talks about them. Um, they may have less confidence in their own memory or feel like they won't be believed or taken seriously or be challenged. Uh, they may have reluctance to disagree with adults. Again, the thing many kids have, we don't teach kids to disagree with adults. We teach them, you know, Adults are the holders of information. We know what we're talking about. It's not often that they'll automatically correct us or disagree with us or challenge us. So uh, we'll talk about that in a bit too, but that could lend to possibly to their suggestibility. Uh, what the research has also seen though is that children with intellectual disabilities can encode, store, and retrieve information as accurately as children without intellectual disabilities when they're asked indirect questions. So again, we want to use those indirect open-ended questions. Of course, adjust your question type as needed as you regularly go throughout your forensic interview. Uh, but know that kids with intellectual disabilities can store, encode, store, and retrieve information uh, the same as kids without intellectual disabilities. They may just communicate it differently. Uh, this was a study that was conducted on children who had alleged abuse, and they were all between about five and 18 years old. Uh, they were all also interviewed more than one time in this study. What they found was that in each subsequent interview, the children uh, or 80% of the information from the previous interviews were new or elaborated. So uh, what they also found was that it didn't contradict the earlier disclosures. So what I think, again, a fear that we have in this field is that we're going to get, oh, I'm going to back up just a second because I want to preface this a little differently. You know, for the last 30 or so years, we've always been talking about the forensic interview. Uh, we just can do one interview. We're going to get the information one time. That's how we avoid suggestibility. That's how we avoid coercion. Uh, however, sometimes kids do need a follow-up interview or multiple sessions of an interview because every kid goes through their own process of disclosure, which is unique to them. And for some kids, that one interview session really, really works. 
And for other kids, they need something different out of that uh, opportunity. So I actually just this morning finished a three day expanded interview training. Uh, we call it Child First X. It is uh, applicable to all other nationally recognized protocols. And some of those other nationally recognized protocols also have their own training for extended or expanded or multi session interviews. Uh, what they are is just one interview broken up into multiple sessions and there are a few populations that could benefit from that process and those pop some of those populations are kids with cognitive disabilities or linguistic challenges so they can have more time to communicate more time to build rapport more time for you to learn how they communicate more time to process more time to talk through those things and so what this study found was in subsequent interview sessions kids were providing new information or they were elaborating on the previous information, but none of it contradicted itself. Uh, and the kids generally disagreed with the interviewer's suggestion. Uh, there was some limitations to this study. Uh, the interviews, interviewers had varying skills, so there was some varying output. Uh, research sometimes specifically on the forensic interview itself can be hard to replicate perfectly without all the variables, but uh, they did find some really great information in that study. Uh, here's a questioning chart. If you have taken Child First or any other training from Zero Abuse Project, you may have seen this. This pops up a lot for us because it is really important. Uh, this is a chart, just kind of a visual, looking at what kids may typically be able to provide based on their age. Uh, know, however, that everything on this chart is based on age, ability, and trauma. So just the age part is displayed to us, but any of it can be affected by the trauma the child's experienced or their abilities or disabilities. Uh, so what this is showing is the dark purple shading shows what kids can typically answer based on their age. Uh, the light blue shading is just slightly harder to see, but that represents what kids may be able to answer based on their age. Some kids can, and some kids it's a bit too advanced. Uh, and again, all of this can be um, affected by ability and trauma. So it's a great thing to reference and know going into an interview, uh, but know that every kid is going to be slightly different. But it's helpful for me to know, you know, I'm not going to go in and ask a three year old uh, when something happened, because that's something that's hard for all of these age groups. Uh, so young kids can usually give you who and what. As they get older, they can typically tell you if it's happened one time or more than one time and possibly where. Uh, as kids are gets older, they can start to sequence. So first this happened, then this happened, and then this, they can provide order. Uh, as they get older, they can start to provide the circumstance surrounding the victimization or the experience. Uh, they then may be able to provide episodic details. So that episode, one specific event, everything that happened with all the sensory information. Uh, and then as you see, again, it's hard for most kids to answer exactly when something happened. Uh, but just something to reference uh, going into your interviews can be a helpful tool. So now I'm going to get a bit into uh, pre-interview preparation. I bummed everyone out with a lot of those statistics. I know I apologize, but it's very important to be aware of what it is that we're dealing with uh, and why. So those statistics as well as some of those risk factors or vulnerabilities to disclosing. So now that we're going to interview children with disabilities, what are we going to do? How are we going to prepare for this process? Uh, first, we want to be aware of negative attitudes or misconceptions. Uh, so know that a kid that may have speech production problems doesn't signal an intellectual impairment. Um, I love to use this example because it's very personal and close to me, but my nephew, he is seven years old now. Uh, he, when he didn't start talking until he was about three years old. So fairly late, he's the second uh, of three in his family. So both of his sisters uh, started talking much, much younger. Uh, he didn't start talking until he was about three. And even between three and five, he was very hard to understand because he communicated primarily with vowel sounds and not consonants. He also got very, very frustrated very easily, especially when you asked him a few times to repeat himself or you didn't understand, so you kind of went to the next thing, he'd get very easily frustrated. Uh, he had some assessments done when he was three. I don't remember exactly what, this was years ago now, and he's my nephew, uh, not my child, but he had some assessments done. And what they found uh, with a the speech therapist and some other specialists 
they found that his receptive communication was very, very high. He could receive and understand information at about five years old at that of a kid at like seven, eight or nine years old. So his receptive communication, incredibly strong. However, the output of information, he couldn't communicate it as well because of the way he used language. He couldn't always communicate back what he was thinking or feeling or wanted to communicate. So he would get extremely frustrated. If you had just met this child and didn't know anything about him, uh, you may think he, he has some kind of intellectual disability or something different, but he, he doesn't. Uh, he's had assessments for um, autism and, and some other things because he has some other behaviors, but he just wasn't able to output information the same way he could receive it. So know that kids output information differently than they input information, and that doesn't necessarily itself signal a disability. It may just signal that you need some additional um, time to communicate. Yeah, someone put in the chat, almost like aphasia, right? Aphasia is, yeah, a little bit more of an advanced, but very similar where like you just physically can't communicate uh, the things that you want to. Um, so yeah, so know that if kids communicate differently, it doesn't automatically signal an ability or disability. Uh, cognitive impairment is unrelated research finds to the ability to distinguish truth from lie. And it also is unrelated to the reliability of memory. So um, I know early on in my career, when I would interview kids with disabilities, there was concern on whether or not this child would even be found competent to stand trial or be able to testify. Um, and, and you know, I, I get some aspects of that, uh, but at the same time, I'm like, are we just writing this kid off because uh, on the bottom line, we don't think that they could even distinguish between the truth and a lie, but research finds that's not the case, and uh, just the disability itself does not indicate whether or not the child can distinguish between those two concepts. Uh, additionally, you will need to be prepared to arrange your space for any potential physical disabilities. Uh, so, Like I mentioned earlier, if you haven't yet, do a walkthrough of your space. See if it is set up to be able to serve kids with all different kinds of mobility needs. Uh, is there room to navigate a wheelchair or a walker or somebody who utilizes a cane uh, or something different through your space? Uh, is there a space if they use a wheelchair, um, if they prefer to stay in that, is there a space for the wheelchair to be in your interview room or the ability to rearrange to make space for that? Um, so just go through and look at your space and make sure that it, all aspects that the child may uh, interact with or parents as well. The parents sometimes may come in with disabilities uh, that it is accessible to all of those folks using our um, Some other things we can do to prepare for these interviews are reading personal records or charts. Um, I personally don't do a lot of reading of personal records and charts, but I do inquire with the caregivers of whether or not the child has an IEP or an individualized education plan, a 504. <laughs> or uh, I get, is it 504? I think yes. Uh, or other medical and cognitive evaluations they may have. So I'm inquiring about that stuff from the caregivers as well as social workers. Um, sometimes caregivers or parents, unfortunately, are the offenders. So I may not go directly to them for that kind of information. Uh, but some other people that may be able to provide that information may be social workers if they've had ongoing access with this kid. Uh, maybe folks at school that work with a child, um, aides or paraprofessionals or teachers, uh, or maybe other family members that are close or have caregiving uh, uh, responsibilities with the child. Uh, so some things that you may ask about, maybe the child's developmental level, how they communicate. I like to ask, what are all the ways your child communicates? Um, because some kids communicate with words, but they may also use some signs, whether it's American Sign Language or um, just some adapted signs that are used within the home or within the family unit. Uh, I want to be aware of that. Some kids may verbally communicate, but they may also use a board or a facilitated device or draw or write. Uh, I want to be aware of all of the ways that kids communicate. Um, kids also communicate with their body language. Another thing I like to ask prior to an interview is if your child gets nervous or anxious or stressed out, what are some triggers or what are some signs to you that that's happening? You know, some kids uh, clam up, some kids just get quiet and shut down. Uh, some kids pick at their fingernails or pull at their, I had kids pull at their eyebrow hairs. 
uh, whatever it is, uh, I like to be aware of those signs too, because if I notice those signs, I want to be able to bring it back down or maybe take a break or whatever that child might need to de-stress a little bit again within that thing. So it's helpful to, uh, to talk with caregivers or parents prior to the interview. That may look different for you folks and how you do it. Some places do it over the phone while you schedule. Uh, some places after it's scheduled may have an advocate reach out and ask those questions. Uh, some folks may do that the day of the interview when the family arrives. Um, so just as long as you're able to gather some of that information ahead of time. I think especially with kids with disabilities or kids that communicate differently, it's helpful to have the information ahead of time. So if you do need to prepare something like uh, a facilitation device for communication or an interpreter, uh, that you're able to do that ahead of time and prepare not only them, but also prepare yourself uh, to know how to use those devices with the child. So the most important thing to remember in these cases is that a child with disabilities isn't just their disability and they must be viewed from all aspects of their identity. So these are just some examples. Kids may have different developmental issues that impact how they talk or communicate uh, or uh, interact with you. There may also be societal influences or um, issues related to the disability, educational influences, family influences, or just individual, you know, personal issues, anything else going on in their life at home, at school that may impact how they can communicate with you or how they're willing to communicate with you. Uh, kids are not just their uh, disabilities. Kids are so many things, uh, so many parts, just like we all are. We're all so many different pieces of our own identities. Uh, so we need to keep all of these in mind and not just that disability when we're preparing. Uh, so here is like some sample language you could utilize in those pre-meetings or when you're gathering information about the child prior to the interview. Uh, what's their primary disability and are there additional disabilities? Uh, how does the disability impact functioning? See, rather I'm not asking is the child high or low functioning because that's not really gonna provide me with any information that's gonna be helpful in preparing for the interview, like we talked about. So how does it impact their functioning? Uh, is the child highly distractible? Uh, I think in general, it's a pretty good rule to have uh, less distracting interview rooms, but uh, just in case, maybe you need to remove some additional distractions. Uh, and what mode or what modes of communication does the child utilize? Again, they may use one, they may use more than one. Uh, as a quick aside, because this is specifically a about disabilities, but sometimes kids just use multiple languages. They may be bilingual or multilingual. Um, so in addition to that, I think it can also be helpful to uh, get an interpreter for cases, even if a child speaks the same language as you, if they also speak another language, uh, they may not have language in English to communicate to you what happened, or maybe the abuse was perpetrated in Spanish or a different language. Uh, so that's how they know how to communicate about it. Uh, so it's just another thing to keep in mind, again, slightly off topic from here, but another thing that I think is uh, just important to consider. Um, some more questions you may ask to generate uh, ways to prepare. Uh, is there a marked difference between receptive and expressive communication, like my nephew I talked about? Uh, does the child have behavioral challenges? Tell me about those. Uh, are they self-abusive? Are they assaultive? Uh, some kids may get really reactive uh, when communicating about things. So I, I want to know about those ahead of time. And that's, again, where I think those anxiety provokers are really important to know about. You know, what are some signs that your child may be triggered or your child may be getting stressed or anxious, especially if they may be combative or self-injurious? I, I want to try to mitigate that uh, before it happens in the interview. Uh, in the hundreds of children I've interviewed, I've interviewed so many of them who have had um, compulsive issues or um, acting out issues or self-injurious or even assaultive kind of behaviors. Uh, and I've never once had an issue with a kid in the interview room because it's our jobs as interviewers to, to be in tune with all of the ways that kid is communicating and navigating that interview. And if I'm noticing a kid uh, getting heightened, getting upset, and we're going to bring it back down. We're going to bring it back to something neutral, or we're going to take a break. I'm going to check in to see if they need water or a fidget, or uh, kids may mean a lot of different things. But um, uh, that's still something I want to know ahead of time so I can prepare and so I can watch for those signs in that interaction. Uh, another thing that may be helpful for the investigation is to inquire uh, about 
the behaviors the child may be having. Do they have compulsive or assaultive behaviors uh, or self-injurious behaviors? And uh, around when did that start? Uh, you may be able to correlate a timeline with also when the abuse began uh, in your investigations. And sometimes that can just help with corroboration. Um, so some things you need to do when you're uh, preparing for the interview after you've learned a bit about the child is to become familiar with their communication method. Um, so I interviewed a vulnerable adult recently who uh, was nonverbal. Um, she, there was about four or five words, I think, that she used regularly and then some others that she used sometimes, but she could very, very clearly indicate yes and no. But it wasn't verbally yes and no. It was like a very excited grin and like nodding for yes and like looking down and kind of an aggressive head shake for no. Um, so I wanted to practice that with her a lot in rapport to really get to learn about how she communicated, make sure I understood the difference between the yes and the no and understood what, you know, that we were communicating on the same page. So I needed some time to become familiar with that. I talked with her care provider in the home she was living in a lot ahead of time to prepare about how she communicated. Uh, also understand the ethics of working with an interpreter or facilitator. Um, so we actually at Zero Bees Project do have two fairly new trainings that I think are very exciting. One is for interviewers or other MDT members on using an interpreter, what you need to know about the process, how to train them and get them involved and implemented, and the ethics uh, of using them. And then we also have a new, uh, very new training specifically for interpreters. So uh, check that out at Zero Abuse Project uh, if you're interested in getting some interpreters through a training so they understand exactly what's expected of them within the process as well. Um, some other ways we could communicate uh, may be using dolls or diagrams. Uh, a research study showed that uh, adults with mild to severe developmental disabilities were very effective in utilizing dolls or anatomical diagrams to um, help explain or describe what had happened or clarify. Uh, they can make representational shift, which is their ability to see themselves reflected on something outside of their body. So they could recognize that the doll or the diagram was meant to represent them in their experience. Uh, dolls were slightly easier to use for the diagrams in this, and I think that's because they're 3D. You can actually show and demonstrate rather than point to, uh, but both were effective. Uh, and then one more thing in preparation is the schedule. Make sure to select an appropriate setting, um, you know, Child Advocacy Center, somewhere that's accessible, somewhere that's comfortable. Uh, you want to ensure privacy and minimize distractions. Uh, like I said, consider space for wheelchairs, mobility devices, or interpreters if you'll be using them. Um, be familiar with the medications the child is taking. You don't need to be familiar with like the medication itself and all, all the things it does, but I want to know if the child takes meds and if they've taken them that day, and maybe how they're different, whether or not they've taken them or not taken them. Uh, be aware of their schedule and routines. I'm just really not trying to schedule something over their nap time or over like a field trip or something they're really excited about unless it's absolutely necessary for uh, the assessment of their safety. Uh, and advocate for additional time to complete interviews when necessary. So if you have that expanded or multi-session interview training, it can be really, really helpful with some of these kids. All right. Now we're going to go into the interview process with some of this time we have left. I'm going to go through some of these a little bit quick because uh, you do have these available to you in the PowerPoint uh, that you were provided with. Um, so some things you could do would be have materials available or tools to manage some of the stress. Um, the furniture, is it comfy? Uh, uh, we have track lighting in our interview room so we can tone down the lights or put them up if a kid has different sensory needs. Uh, we have a weighted blanket. Some kids really enjoy the weighted blanket while we're talking to them. I always just keep it next to the couch and, and let kids know there's a weighted blanket there and you're welcome to use it whenever you want. Uh, some of the real little kids I need to help them with, it's a little heavy, but kids really love that. Uh, fidgets, be mindful of the noise your fidget makes. Uh, some of them may not sound too noisy in the interview room, but if you have a really sensitive microphone, uh, your team is hearing it and you'll be hearing it on that recording. So just something to be mindful of. Uh, I like pipe cleaners or those like rubber monkey tail things I think can be really good and are quiet. Uh, the poppet things are quiet enough and I have a very sensitive microphone, but uh, other things outside of that get a little bit noisy and clicky clacky. 
Uh, some of those interview tools like dolls and diagrams can assist. Uh, you want to make sure your team members are observing, actively taking notes. You want to give all your attention to that child. Uh, best practice is to accurately video and audio record your interviews and use a forensic interview protocol. Don't just go rogue on how you're interviewing the kiddos. Um, so some phases of the interview we may see is you want to prepare for the interview. Uh, you need to spend some uh, appropriate time uh, building rapport with the child and preparing them for the interaction. You then may transition and gather details once they've made a disclosure. Close the interview with the child, but always remember to include the family in uh, next steps in planning. So we're not just sending them on their way, kind of not having any idea what might happen next. Uh, for those of you familiar with Child First, these are our identified phases. We incorporate all of the same like phases and structures or, or implement or things that other uh, protocols do. Uh, they just may, the phases just may look a little different to you. So in our introduction, we should always be explaining our role and the process in developmentally friendly terms. Uh, so my name's Katie and it's my job to listen to kids and I'm going to listen to you today. Okay. We're using developmentally friendly language uh, and provide interview instructions as needed. So these are things like, if I ask you something today and you're not sure, it's okay to tell me that. I don't want you to guess today. Again, remember kids want to please adults and interviewers, so we want them to know it's okay to tell us if they don't know. Or if I get something wrong today, it's okay for you to correct me. Uh, we want to provide for the child's needs in the interview, so ensure they have a comfortable place to uh, sit in the interview. Uh, this is a good suggestion for all interviews is to take care not to touch the child. Touch, uh, they may interact with touch very differently uh, than some other kids, but in general, uh, don't initiate touch in the interview. I've had some kids come up to me and like rest their arm on my leg or like, you know, uh, try to interact some of those ways, sit next to me, and that's fine, but I'm never going to initiate that kind of Want to limit people in the interview room the only time we should have an additional person is if that child needs an interpreter or facilitator for their communication uh, and again we should be explaining the interview process just like in our other interviews as we go know that you may need to spend more time building rapport again another reason i think multi-session interviews can be really helpful here you could spend an entire session just in rapport uh, to really get to know this child and get to know how they communicate and for them to get used to our question type. Uh, you may also utilize drawings. Uh, having the child draw, I think, can be really helpful. Uh, again, use open-ended questions and always uh, assess for that developmental level on your own in that interview. I definitely want to gather information about their developmental level, but use that rapport, rapport period of the interview to really get used to how they communicate and how they understand your questions. Uh, here are some sample rapport building questions you can take a look at on the screen here for just a moment or also in your handout. Uh, again, you see that some of these are a little bit more direct, but then we're always opening them up with, well, tell me about that. Tell me more about that. Sometimes we need to generate a little bit more direct questions with some kids that communicate differently, but we do want to follow it up with those open ended. Tell me about that. Uh, in the interview, we should be using plain language that's simple and concrete and match the child's vocabulary, syntax, and grammar. So even if a child says something like, well, that's when he herded me, I'm going to say, tell me about when he herded you. Uh, I'm not going to correct the grammar or the vocabulary. I'm using the child's language for how they communicate about the event. Remember to ask one question at a time. Don't put multiple questions into one. Uh, and avoid when. I did talk a little bit earlier that when can be really hard for a lot of kids to answer. They'll likely guess if we ask them when. Uh, you can ask things about how old they were when it started or the last time it happened or really exploring all the other things that happened that day can sometimes get us information that you could corroborate a timeline outside of the interview. Uh, cognitive age may not be consistent with social age, but again, it's too... Uh, kind of rudimentary, too basic, too simple to say that kid presents like a four-year-old. What does that mean? Figure out what that means, because uh, that could mean a lot of different things to me. 
uh, throughout the interview, uh, don't always expect a chronological uh, recitation of events. Sometimes we need to be the organizer in there. We need to draw back to what we were talking about. Sometimes they might bop all the way around. Uh, that just might be how they communicate. Uh, again, kids may not automatically indicate if they don't understand. So we do need to be tuned into their body language and, and how they're communicating with us. You know, sometimes kids will indicate they don't understand by like, um, uh, well, it might have been, or they respond with an answer that doesn't make any sense. Uh, we can check in and remind them, like, uh, I heard you say it might have been, and I wanted to remind you that we don't have to get in this room today. So if I ask you something and you don't understand, you can tell me that. Uh, with kids with different sensory impairments or sensitivities, we want to be aware of our setting. Uh, like I said, we use track lighting. I've worked with other folks before who don't have track lighting. They just had fluorescent lighting, but they brought lamps into the interview room instead. Uh, that's been helpful. Some kids may like to prefer facing away from windows. So if there are windows in your room, uh, what does that setup look like? Do they have blinds you can draw? Uh, you may need to describe the room setup ahead of time or explain any changes in your own actions while you're in the room. Um, you know, with some kids, I might say, okay, I have markers in this drawer next to me, so I'm just going to open that and get some markers up here. Just letting them know before you make any big actions uh, to help with their comfortability. Also, maintain eye contact with the child, especially kids who communicate differently or maybe need to read lips. Uh, if they use that to supplement how they understand, make sure you're talking clearly. Uh, not condescending, though, not like low and condescending, but just clearly enunciate uh, and be clear. Uh, make sure there's not extraneous objects in the room or a lot of different distractions. Uh, like I said, speak clearly at a normal pace. Uh, you may need to use high contrast pens so, or markers, so maybe not black and navy blue, um, something that the child can really differentiate between. And be aware of your own body language and facial expressions. Uh, this is an extra reminder for folks who have been interviewing in masks for the last two years. If you're no longer interviewing in masks or if you're weaning out of it, be aware that you still have all of this you have to be aware of in that forensic interview. So uh, just know you've been using masks for the last year. You got to retrain this face to not make any kind of facial reactions to anything the child is saying. Uh, generally, we can expect kids with cognitive disabilities to have linguistic abilities similar to kids younger than them, uh, but have normal uh, intellectual functioning. Again, we can't just say this person presents as this age, but they may have more similar communication traits to uh, folks younger than them. Uh, if they're unable to answer a question, it, it may not be due to them not wanting to corroborate but it may be due to like some kind of undiagnosed uh, speech or hearing disorder. So again, we wanna check in uh, with that child's understanding throughout the interview to make sure they're understanding and able to participate. Uh, use common words, developmentally appropriate words and concrete words. Uh, and again, like I said, visuals and drawings can sometimes assist. Uh, so we can ask short, simple questions. You may need to repeat your question. Um, in typical interviews, again, we don't want to repeat the same question. So if kids don't hear or understand, you may ask it in a different way. Um, sometimes kids may just not have been paying attention or may not have heard or may need some more time to process it. So it can sometimes be necessary with some of these kids to repeat your question exactly how you initially answered it. Uh, because if you do change it too quickly, that can be kind of abrupt or confusing to the child. Uh, with kids with hearing disabilities, you want to make sure you have their attention before speaking. Again, they may read your lips to supplement their understanding. So you want to make sure your speech is clear. Um, try not to um, exaggerate or overemphasize or, again, uh, talk in a condescending manner. Uh, be aware that some kids may have some hearing capabilities. So if you're interviewing a child that is hard of hearing or deaf, uh, make sure uh, you shouldn't be saying anything in the interview they shouldn't hear anyway, but be aware they may be able to hear something. Uh, again, consider all aspects of functioning before making any kind of final determination. Uh, know, again, like I talked earlier, that input processing and output all could be uh, on different levels. So we're not just assuming because a kid doesn't speak as clearly or the same as other kids that there's something else going on there. 
Uh, don't try to attempt to fill the silence. Silence is your friend in these interviews. If this child is using silence, they may just need more time to process what you said, what they want to respond with, how they want to answer. Use silence. Uh, count to 10. 10 is the magic number. If the child still hasn't responded, maybe check in to make sure that they understood before moving forward or rephrasing your question. Uh, when working with kids with autism, uh, again, know that there are so many levels of autism. Uh, so we want to periodically check in with kids to make sure they're retaining or understanding uh, our communication. Uh, you may spend more time during report to understand how that kid communicates. And uh, this is a good tip for all interviews, but avoid jokes, sarcasm, innuendo, and slang. That's not really appropriate for interviews, uh, but especially with kids with autism, they're very concrete and literal thinkers. Uh, so remain calm, practice patience, always allow the kid to talk at their own pace, and ask for clarification when you don't understand. Uh, know that multiple short interviews may be required. Take breaks as necessary and watch for strines, uh, signs of stress. When I say multiple interviews, I mean multiple sessions of interviews, so like a multi-session. After the interview, we should be continuing to address the child's needs by providing support, protection, making appropriate referrals uh, for mental health, medical exams, or other supportive services. Uh, know that you should have a plan, prepare ahead of time, ask those questions and prepare if needed, different facilitation devices, reach out for technical assistance is a great way to prepare. So again, I'm always here to facilitate or assist you. Uh, understand and be mindful of your question formation. And like I said, silence is your friend. All right, those a lot of suggestions. Like I said, we those are in your packet for you. I wanted to make sure we got all those in. Uh, I love this quote here. Um, Michelle and Michelle say that maltreatment of individuals with disabilities may be committed by only a few, but the responsibility to protect them uh, belongs to us all. So I know I'm going right up to our time here. So I'm very briefly going to pass it back to William. But right before I do that, I just want to thank each and every one of you so much for the work that you do. You're so important to your communities and thank you for spending your really precious time with me today uh, to be able to better serve some of those kids in your community. So thank you all so much. Uh, William, back to you. Great, yes. Thank you, Katie, uh, for your wonderful presentation. And again, thank you to uh, our audience for um, staying on for today. Uh, please note that before we exit and in today, I have a few quick announcements to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, please be sure to fill out the poll question. It should be on the right hand side of your WebEx interface there. If it's not popping up there, you may have to look and search and click on polling or there may be a, an ellipsis that you click on and you should see the option where it says polling. Uh, please take a moment to complete the poll question there. You have about four minutes to do so prior to us uh, exiting for today. Um, but in regards to other announcements uh, really quickly, I uh, just wanted to remind the audience that you will receive a certificate of attendance within 24 hours of today's webinar. Uh, it will come via a WebEx thank you email. So please be sure to look out for that um, particular email. And if you have any questions about that certificate, you can contact the OJJDP TTA help desk. Uh, I'll put that information up shortly. Um, so the next uh, item that I wanted to mention to everyone is to please be mindful that you can contact uh, INTEC uh, via OJJDP's website. The URL to contact Intech is located there, so please feel free to uh, um, go there if you have any questions in regards to OJJDP's Intech. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, here are all the ways you can contact OJJDP. Again, through the help desk, the telephone number, and the email address is there as well as visiting their website. I highly recommend you go to their website. Uh, they have a lot of resources there uh, for you to uh, access.
And then we do uh, suggest that you sign up for the Juve Just List Serve. That Juve Just Just List Serve will allow for you to see announcements from OJJDP about various events uh, uh, and different things that come out throughout the year. So please be sure to go there and subscribe. And then we also encourage you to please uh, visit OJJDP's event events page to learn more about upcoming webinars. Uh, we also, again, like I said at the top of the hour, please be sure to go to OJJDP's multimedia and YouTube page. Here you'll be able to find, again, uh, web events that have been recorded and placed there in relationship to, to juvenile justice, child victimization prevention as well. If you would like any supporting materials, you can contact the OJJDP TTA help desk, uh, and, or you can reach out to us through the uh, website that you see there, the email address that you see there, excuse me. And last but certainly not least, we do encourage you all to please connect with OJJDP via the various social media uh, that you can see here. So uh, through Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, et cetera, we encourage you to please connect to um, OJJDP through those multiple channels. Um, so we are right at 4.30 Eastern time. Uh, we will go ahead and conclude today's web event. Again, thank you to Katie for this wonderful and important information that she's provided to our audience today. Everyone take care and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye for now.